All right, so moving on to chapter 11, this is going to be on the shared decision making for periodontal care. And if in your, in your book, it, this is going to be on page 201. And for a moment, I want you to just turn back to page 200, where it says part three. These are the risk factors for periodontal disease. So for a minute, let's think about why on earth they would put shared decision making in the same section as risk factors for periodontal disease. And I can tell you right now that you're probably not considering your patients, um, including them in the decision making, as one of the risk factors for why they may or may not get better. But uh, I'm here to tell you that it's, it's probably one of the most important components of whether or not that patient will get better is did they agree to the treatment plan that you gave them or do they help you make it kind of thing. Okay, here we go. So, when it comes to shared decision making, this is the crux of patient centered care. You cannot have patient centered care without letting your patient be a part of the decision making process. It is a collaborative process that recognizes the patient's rights to make decisions about their care after being fully informed about the options. So you have to give them all of the information and then let them make the decision and then respect that decision that they make. The patient is going to be recognized as the best expert for judging the value of treatments. You can't decide how valuable the treatment is, okay? Only they can decide this. And then the appropriate uh, where there is more than one reasonable option. So this, as far as them making decisions, you want to be able to give them all of the options. Now, if there's only one option, they don't have a lot of options, do they? <laughs> they can't make any decisions if there's no decision to be made. So that's that's what that means. This is that model that we look at. This is on page 202. Uh, it's the shared decision-making model for evidence-based decisions. And now we'll see this again when we get to research, and you'll probably see it in, in public health as well. Uh, but it goes into the three components. This has kind of a fourth. Uh, for how to make decisions is as a clinician. So here we need to go through the best possible scientific evidence and figure out does the research support whatever these options we're giving the patient are. Um, our clinical experience, can we do the treatment that they are asking us to do? If you're not laser certified, and laser is the standard of care, that's what research says to do. Well, guess what? You're not giving your patients laser therapy because you're not qualified to do it. And then the patient's preferences. So if they don't want laser therapy, guess what? You're not doing laser therapy. Uh, and then periodontal condition here is one of the other components. This isn't something we talk about a lot, but you know what needs to happen, whether or not they actually need the treatment is a pretty good uh, factor in the decision-making model. So evidence-based information is the systematic approach to clinical problem solving. It allows the integration of the best available research evidence with our clinical expertise, can we physically perform the treatments we are recommending, and patient values. If they don't value what you're doing for them, it won't help them. Systematic reviews. So there is a system in place where you can have access to the best possible research evidence. It, uh, it's called the Cochrane Collaboration, I believe. Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews. This is on page 203. It summarizes the results of available, carefully designed healthcare studies. We're going to go into this pretty in depth when we get to research. But the idea here is that no matter who you are, no matter you know whether you have access to a university's library or not, you have access to health information. It provides a high level of evidence on effectiveness of healthcare interventions, and it involves significant others from cultural, social, and age groups. The, the idea here is that they have uh, many countries, it says more than 130 countries, and it was formed to be able to make decisions not based on you know, where you live and your cultural sort of views of it, but also you know, in areas where they don't have those cultural views, does that treatment still work? Um, so here, when it comes to the systematic review characteristics, they, you want to develop a partnership with the patient 
uh, this actually is labeled incorrectly. This shouldn't say systematic review characteristics. Uh, this should say characteristics of shared decision making. I'll change this. You might not even notice the difference. Um, so you're going to develop a partnership with the patient. First, you have to build rapport, earn their trust. You have to establish the patient's preferences, and you do this through asking them questions, right? Finding out about them. Respond to the patient's ideas and expectations of therapy. If they come in and they have, you know, their teeth are about to fall out and their expectation is they're going to walk out with that perfect Hollywood smile, you're probably going to need to dampen their expectations just a bit. And then you're going to identify the best choices for treatment after evaluating the research. So if they need laser therapy, you're going to probably give them a couple of options for that once you know that their laser therapy is the best re according to the research laser therapy is the treatment they need uh, you're going to allow the patient to reflect on alternative treatments so at any given time you say you know this is the treatment that i recommend it's what you know i my professional opinion and here are your other options you could always go with a b or c um, and then of course they always have the option to not have treatment you're going to develop the care plan in partnership so you're going to say you know this is what i think we should do what would you like to do and they will tell you what they want to do and you know you're going to come up with a with a, a way to get that done and then you're going to document that agreed upon periodontal care plan we do sort of an essence of this when they sign a consent form in our clinic right we say you need this treatment and they have the option to say no i do not want that treatment and you would just document that saying the patient declined um but when they sign that form it basically says yes we are we are doing this we have talked about it uh, so the shared care planning this is share information Right? We're going to teach them as much as we can about their conditions. We're going to discuss and agree on goals. So you need to let them know, hey, you're not walking out with a Hollywood smile. Our goal is to stop the progression of disease. We're going to jointly review the plan. So you're going to say, this is you know, typically what we do, and would you like to do that? And they would say yes or no. You're going to record and share the plans. So you're going to give the patient a copy. You're going to put a copy in the record. And then agree on follow-up schedules. If you say you're going to come back every three months and the patient says, uh, no, I'm not. I'm coming back every six. Well, guess what? <laughs> They're not coming back in three months. Don't put them on the schedule for that. It's a waste of time. Uh, you're going to jointly develop care plan. So, uh, you know, they're going to agree to that plan and uh, you're going to, you know, make it happen. And then, of course, when they get back, you'll reevaluate and you'll share information all over again. Patients' preferences matter. So uh, I feel like it's kind of sad we have to make a whole chapter about this. But yes, their, pre their preferences matter. Uh, before we had a very... Um, uh, a paternal sort of system of healthcare where the healthcare provider would make the decisions and would tell the patient, this is what we're going to do and you're going to like it. And now we have a very different sort of approach to the way that we treat patients in the healthcare setting. So now we need something called informed consent. And what that provides our patients with is autonomy. So they have the ability to make their own decisions about whether or not they want the treatment we're recommending. Um, and so their, their preferences about the treatment that we recommend, they matter. All choices come with pros and cons. So while you know we might recommend getting an implant and doing all this fancy stuff, if it's too expensive for them, they're probably not going to do it. Um, if several options lead to different outcomes, we want the patient to make the decision based on what will work for them. What are they willing to do? And then when patients participate in that decision making, they're more likely to follow through. So if you say, I need you to floss with string, and they're like, well, I'm willing to use string, like the floss picks. And you're like, no, don't use floss picks. They're terrible for you. They're not as good as string floss. And the patient's like, well, okay. And then they go home and they never floss because you told them not to do the thing that they were willing to do, but you didn't want them to do it because you wanted them to do something else. How does that make sense? <laughs> you have to give them something that they are willing to do so that, hello, they're willing to do it. 
So there's two experts in this scenario, right? And it feels like maybe you're, it's just us, the word's the only expert, but we're not. So the clinician is going to be the expert in dental care. We understand the etiology of disease. We see what's going on in their mouths. We know what we can provide for them, and we have a reasonable expectation of those outcomes, right? But they are an expert on whether or not they're going to brush their teeth. They're an expert on whether or not they're allergic to something. They're the expert on whether or not they're going to stop smoking. So if we're the ones giving them all of the information without taking into account who they are, then we're not going to be very effective in our treatment. So try to keep in mind that they're the expert on them. Sharing the expertise here, so the clinician's expertise is going to be the diagnosis of the condition, but the patient has to experience that clinician. I don't know, I don't have advanced periodontal disease, so I have no idea what that actually feels like. I only know what people say it feels like. And then the disease etiology is something that we understand. We know what causes it, but they know what happened in their lives. You know, if there's someone who grew up poor and they never had a toothbrush, well, then yeah, I can say, oh, you didn't take good care of your teeth, but they're like, there's a reason why I didn't take good care of them. Uh, we have an expertise in the prognosis. We understand, you know, how is this going to progress, right? But they have an attitude to their risk factors. So if, you know, they feel like, no, that's not, you know, going to happen to me because of this and this, well, they might be right. Uh, treatment options, we understand their treatment options, but they understand how valuable those things are to them. So if it comes down to buying food for their kids or buying periodontal maintenances every three months, they might choose buying food for their kids, okay? And they're not wrong for that. Um, outcome probability, so we understand, you know, um, that's, uh, I think in my mind, pretty close to prognosis, but we understand, you know, what are the possible outcomes that could happen and, you know, what is the likelihood that this implant will fail and they know what their preferences are. So they understand, okay, I want this implant to make it, so I'm going to make it, make it. <laughs> Um, when it comes to poor decision quality here, this is when we don't communicate the way that we need to. The patients are unaware of their treatment options or their management options, and they don't understand the outcomes of those decisions. And the clinician is unaware of the patient's circumstances and preferences. So a lot of times you'll find that clinicians don't ask, you know, what are the barriers holding you back from making this decision? Why don't you want this treatment? And if we understand why they don't want something or why they do want something, we're better equipped to be able to make it a feasible thing for them. And they might not want it because they don't understand how important it is, right? So this is our, our dilemma as clinicians. Moving on to section two, this is a model for shared decision-making in periodontal care. This starts on page 206. So here you'll see this image, the five essential steps of shared decision-making. First, we want to seek our patient's participation. If they're not willing to do the work, there's no point in going for it. Uh, we want to help our patients explore and compare treatment options. If there's an alternative to what you're recommending, it is a good idea to tell your patient what that alternative is. Because while for you, you might think that's a terrible alternative, you would definitely not want to do something like that, your patient might want to. Um, assess our patients' values and preferences. So if they just don't value their own care, like many moms, they don't value themselves over their kids, right? So in this, if we're working with a woman and she doesn't want treatment, it might not be that, you know, she doesn't, you know, value herself or she doesn't understand what we're talking about. It might just be that she's got something else that's more important to her. And then uh, reach a decision with your patient. They have to come to a decision and both of you make the plan based off of that decision. And we want to evaluate your patient's decision. So, you know, if they say, I absolutely don't want to quit smoking, well, why don't they want to quit smoking? Is it, what, what is it about smoking that they love? Is it, you know, that they love the feeling? Is it a social dynamic? What is it about the, about smoking? 
So we want to seek our patient's participation, summarize their condition, and clearly describe these things to our patients, ask for their participation in how best to treat them. We want to include their family and their caregivers in the discussion if they allow us to. <laughs> Don't go asking somebody's spouse for you know, something if they didn't say you should do that. And then we wanna remind the patient that their input is important. Their feelings and thoughts and values are important to us because it is how we go about giving them the best possible care. Um, we want to help our patient to explore and compare treatment options. So avoid technical jargon when explaining options, right? We don't want to use terms like non-surgical periodontal therapy. Go ahead and use, uh, you know, deep cleaning when we talk to our patients because we have to bring the information down to them at their level and not in the sense that, you know, they're, they're not as smart as us, but they didn't go through years of hygiene and so they don't know the words we use clearly present the benefits of each option. Why would they choose whatever they would choose? Give them all of the pros and the cons. We want to provide evidence-based tools. So when I talk to my patients and I say, you know, your kiddo needs a sealant, um, obviously I'm talk not talking to my patient, I'm talking to the patient's parent, but if I talk to my patient's parents and I say, you know, so-and-so is eligible for a sealant, uh, sealants have an 85 to 90 percent success rate over the next five years at preventing a cavity on the surface that they are placed on. My patients are like, oh, okay, yeah, let's do some sealants, right? And then we want to evaluate the patient's understanding of those options. So if they're like, oh, no, they're not paying attention to you, and you're like, um, you know, are you sure you don't want to do this? They're like, no, nah, no. Nah. They're like back on their phone or something like that. You know, you want to figure out what it is. You know, do they truly understand you? And, and that requires not looking at your computer screen, but actually looking at your patient while you talk to them. Assess your patient's values and preferences. So ask your patient what's important to them and what their concerns are. If all they're concerned about is the aesthetic, well, eventually periodontal disease is going to lead to a poor aesthetic, right? It's going to make them lose teeth and that's going to reduce their vertical dimension. So it's important that we, um, you know, figure out what's important to them so that we can make sure we avoid all of the things that are important that they don't want to, that they don't want right? Encourage dialogue on what matters most to the patient. So a lot of times with this, like if I get a teenager and, um, you know, I'm like, you know, do you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend kind of thing to teenagers? And they're like, oh, yes, I do. Or no, I don't. Right. Well, when I'm talking to them about flossing, I'm like, you probably want to floss your teeth so that you won't have bad breath because nobody wants to kiss a kid who has bad breath. Right. So, um, th this is just one of those things you got to figure out what matters to them and try to get them to see how their oral health fits into their overall health, which probably fits into their values. Uh, and we need to do this by listening to our patients. We need to create an environment where they feel comfortable talking to us in a way that we do not judge them. We want to show empathy and interest for any of their life problems. So we hear it a lot, but um, our patients kind of do think of us as therapists. They come in and they, they tell us about their lives. And it's one of the greatest things about being a dental hygienist is getting to know your patients on such a deeper level than just whether or not they brush and floss. Um, and in doing this, in, in getting to know your patients and creating that rapport with them, we will be able to figure out what's important to them and we'll tailor our treatment plans to that. And then we want to agree on what's important to our patients. If, you know, periodontal therapy right now isn't that important, let's give them an idea of like, okay, maybe next time we do periodontal therapy, or maybe we can set up kind of some kind of treatment plan if what's important to them is the financial component of things. We need to figure out ways to make it work so that we can provide the treatment we want to. Reach a decision with the patient. So ask your patient if they're ready to decide, right? We don't want to just say, well, what do you want, right? And they're like, um, um, right? Ask them, like, you know, if you're not ready to decide right now, that's okay. You can come back at a different day. We can figure this out. We can do this today and you can decide next time. It does, it's, there's no pressure. We want to confirm their decision. So we hear this a lot with, when it comes to like listening, but we want to like repeat back to them. Okay, I, I understand that you want this treatment because of this and this reason. And they'll say yes or no. Um, assist the patient to follow through with decisions. So we want to make sure that the treatment that we recommend is 
feasible for them. If there's someone, you know, a lawyer who's working 100 hours a week, they probably don't have time to brush and floss and water pick and proxy brush and, uh, you know, do all of those things three times a day. That's that's probably an unrealistic expectation with them. So we want to make sure that the things we recommend are suited to them. If it's someone who's retired, yeah, go ahead and give them all the stuff. Um, assist in removing any barriers to implementing the decision. So here again, you know, if the financial component is the barrier, maybe try to work out some type of treat or uh, payment plan. Um, if it's a matter of, you know, their kids need medicine and they or they get treatment, well, then you need to just be understanding. Um, evaluate your patient's decision. So we want to make plans to review any postponed treatment. Um, here, this is a good idea when you treatment plan um, to say, hey, at this time, you know, we're going to do this. And so next time we're going to do this treatment. And not only is it going to make you more valuable in your office as far as like, you know, reminding patients, hey, remember that filling that you have? We probably want to get that filled. But it's also going to um, I mean, as long as you're not annoying your patients about it, like you're trying to nag them or anything, but um, as long as you uh, go about it in a really kind, sort of friendly reminder sort of way, then your patients will appreciate that kind of thing. They don't want to come in and you give them a whole list of things and then they walk out like, well, you know, they didn't say when I was supposed to do it. I don't know when I'm supposed to go back kind of thing. Um, you want to monitor the extent of the treatment implement implementation. So, you know, how involved is this? Is it going to be four or five appointments? Then, you know, maybe you want to, you know, set them up with all of those appointments or set them up with the next one and make the next one after that. Um, and revisit that decision with the patient if anything changes or other options are needed. So a lot of times with patients, I tell them like, okay, you're, you know, you're all set for the day. Uh, you had this and this done. And so next time you come in, you're going to be this. However, if anything changes, give us a call, right? Because we want to know if anything goes wrong. If you wake up suddenly in pain tomorrow, I want to know about it. Section three is the decision aids for a periodontal patient. This is on page 210. So the decision aids are things like informed, resor informed resources, uh, resources of informed consent, like written materials, videos, and web-based tools. Uh, these are all types of flyers. In most of your operatories, there are these little like flip charts in there, which have diagrams and images and things like that, that you can show your patient to help reinforce some of those concepts that you might have a hard time describing without images. Um, also use their x-rays. Um, improve knowledge of options. So we want to, um, well, that's just the, the goal of the, the written resources is so that they understand, okay, this is my one option and this isn't, you know, something that I should do or this doesn't apply to me kind of thing. If you go to page 211 in your book, it has a pretty good, like, chart in there that shows you, um, you know, what happens if you choose no treatment? What happens if you get the treatment I'm recommending kind of thing? What are your options there? Um, this is going to allow your patients to feel more informed and clear about what matters most to them. This is going to let them choose basically what kind of treatment they want and they feel comfortable in that decision because they have all of the all of the options, all of the you know outcomes are there. Have accurate expectations of benefits and harms. So here they need to know, you know, if you do a non-surgical therapy on a patient who has severe bone loss, well, they might have sensitivity. Their teeth might become more mobile. There's a lot of negative things that could happen in the process of getting healthier. And so you need to let them know what that is. And you need to elicit better, I'm sorry, the aids will help to elicit better participation in the decision making. So, you know, while the patients usually kind of just sit there and they go, uh-huh, 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 okay. And then you're like, sign here. And they're like, okay. And they're like, do you have any questions? And they're like, oh no, because they don't understand, but they don't know what they don't know. So you, if you don't, if you don't make, give it to them in a way that lets them ask questions because they actually understand what's going on and you don't make it a conversation and you don't show them like, you know, ways for them to follow up with things, then they're not going to ask any questions, but they're going to leave and they're not going to be happy about it. 
uh, typical information from a patient decision aid. So here it might be the description and the condition along, I'm sorry, the description of a condition and symptoms, or it's probably going to have the prognosis. What happens if you choose treatment? What happens if you don't choose treatment? Uh, treatment and self-management options. So here it, a lot of the time it, the, the, decision aids will help you to flip the script basically where it's like you know the patient comes in and they expect you to solve all of their problems well i'm sorry but you can't solve all of their problems so a decision aid in a lot of ways can help the patient to understand that the responsibility of their oral health is is their responsibility and then what is known and what is not known from evidence. It's important to let patients understand that we don't know everything. I'm gonna try this treatment because of anecdotal information, but I don't know whether or not, like there's no study that shows that this works. Uh, we'll talk about that a lot in nutrition, but a lot of studies are, are vague. We don't know. So most frequent complications of the treatment options. So what happens? You know, Are they likely to have sensitivity? Are they likely to have tooth mobility? Are their teeth going to fall out? We, we need to give them those options. As far as section four, these are the guidelines related to consent for periodontal therapy. So the ADHA or American Dental Hygienists Association has a code of ethics. You can find it on their website if you go to ADHA.org. Don't go to ADHA.com. It'll give you some spam. So go to ADHA.org. Um, it states a patient has a right to informed consent prior to treatment. It's not just the ADHA code of ethics that says this, by the way, it is also the law. Informed consent is a well-informed patient is more compliant with treatment recommendations. If they know what's going on, they're more likely to do it. If they don't quite understand, then one, you didn't get informed consent, but two, they're probably not gonna do the things you ask them to do. Patients have a higher trust in healthcare providers when you give them informed consent. Have any of you ever had a doctor or hygienist or a dentist or someone who explained everything they did as they did it? Didn't that make you feel more comfortable? Didn't it make you feel like that person wasn't going to do anything to hurt you? Because they weren't, because they were giving you informed consent. Um, patients are more satisfied with their care. Uh, I find this a lot where if I just explain everything I'm doing to the patient as I'm doing it to them, then they feel more comfortable with me. They leave feeling like, man, that was what a great experience. I learned so much. It's going to lead to better treatment outcomes. One, they feel better about the treatment that they got. They feel like they got the utmost quality care, which is my goal, right? I wanna give them the utmost quality care. And it's going to lead to them taking better care. You don't buy something of value and then trash it, right? If you buy something cheap or something you don't care about, sure, at the dollar store, then you might trash it. But you're not gonna go somewhere and buy something of quality and then go turn around and trash it. So they're more likely, if they value and you give them a good experience, to take care of what you've done. And then it's going to reduce the malpractice risk. So obviously, that's just the legal component of it. Informed consent for periodontal therapy, the process of communication between a patient and healthcare provider, it must be voluntary. Okay, we can't coerce our patients into doing anything. I feel like that's, a, that's a, it should be unsaid, but it has to be said. Uh, demonstrate that they are legally able to provide consent. So um, the patient has to be, you know, old enough and they have to be of, you know, mental capacity to be able to give consent. And then according to a reasonable patient standard. So here, this is at the bottom of page 213, uh, under the reasonable patient and informed consent, it says A, legal claims. Number two, it says um, the reasonable patient standard. This says a healthcare provider must disclose all information that a rational patient would want before making a choice to pursue or reject a treatment or procedure. You do not have to explain the etiology of disease to your patients. You have to summarize to a certain extent the etiology, but you don't have to tell them all about desmosomes and hemidesmosomes, okay? That's, that's not what we're saying here. We're saying that for a reasonable patient, did you provide enough information for that patient to make an informed decision? If you did not, you're held liable. If you did, for a reasonable person, for any reasonable outcomes, as long as what you gave them was 
reasonable, <laughs> then you have done your duty to them. Okay, so reasonable patient standard, I think I actually just read this to you. A healthcare provider must disclose all information that a rational patient would want before making a choice to pursue or reject a treatment or procedure. The healthcare provider who performs the treatment is ultimately responsible to inform the patient before consent. So uh, a dental assistant is not responsible for informed consent before the dentist comes in and provides a filling, right? The dentist is responsible for informed consent, which is why most of the time the dentist will come in and say, hey, we're doing a filling on this and this and this. You got any questions? And that is informed consent, basically. It's it's verbal, but it's, it's there. And then uh, for your cleanings, you are responsible for informed consent. If you don't ask your patient if they have questions, if you don't give them the information about their outcomes before you provide treatment, you're wrong. This slide is the legal claims that the patient could have against you if you do not do these things. So um, this is, uh, it's gonna be whether you performed the treatment as you decided upon. So if your patient said, uh, you know, well, I only want a profi kind of thing, and you were like, oh, okay, and you went ahead and did non-surgical therapy, um, that was not what was agreed upon, uh, and you are held liable for that. Uh, the clinician did not inform patient properly or thoroughly about the risks involved. So if you did not tell your patient there's a good chance your tooth is going to fall out and you performed the treatment and then a day later their tooth fell out, you're, they're, you could be held liable in this case. Okay, You need to tell your patients what those risks are. And then the other factor here is poor record keeping. This is the number one thing that gets hygienists because you know, we get busy and we don't think to write things down, right? This is where templates will be your best friend, right? But when there is a case that is unique, take the time to sit down and write those things out because it's not going to happen a week later, okay? Nobody sues anybody a week later, okay? Usually it takes a couple of years before and any kind of claim ever goes to court or it makes it so that the you know legal team comes asking you for records so you're not going to remember what happened okay it's gone the you know three days later you don't remember what happened so it's really really important that you keep good records what are the goals of informed consent so here our goal is going to be to provide the opportunity to participate in decisions regarding treatment if we give them all of the information about why they should decide, whatever it is they should decide, they will be able to make good decisions. And that is important, okay? In the same sense of that's what you, how you wanna be treated, right? The golden rule, treat them how you wanna be treated. Do not guarantee treatment outcomes to the patient. So you do not wanna say, oh yeah, we're gonna do non-surgical therapy and we are going to get back three millimeters of attachment. Well, no, don't don't say that because you may or may not get three millimeters of attachment back. Um, as far as our goals, they're also going to include um, the diagnosis. Um, well, our goals for our informed consent. So what our informed consent should include is what I should say. So the diagnosis um, or an explanation of their perio condition that warrants the proposed treatment that you are trying to give them, an explanation of the purpose, why are you giving them the treatment, right? Description of the proposed treatment and the individual patient's role and responsibilities during and after treatment. If you don't tell them that they have to brush and floss five times a day, well, then they're probably not going to, and then they're gonna blame you when things don't go right. The known risks and benefits of the proposed treatment. Alternative treatment options. Everybody wants to know what are my options, right? Discuss what happens without treatment. So whenever, um, you are giving them options, you need to let them know that not getting treatment is also an option. Okay, it's, it's not usually a good option. Usually the prognosis is not good on that one, but you do need to let them know that that is an option. Uh, the cost of treatment, never, ever, ever, this was, this is like number one get sued and number one have very unhappy patients who leave very unhappy uh, reviews of your office. But the cost of treatment needs to be very, very well uh, communicated to your patient and it needs to be followed through to AT. Like do not change your rates. Do not raise 
you know, any kind of cost. Don't add things in. If you if you end up doing something that the you guys didn't talk about, like part of the way through, you're like, hey, you want some irrigation? The patient like, sure. You don't get to charge them for that. Okay. If you didn't get them to consent to how much it costs, you don't get to charge them. Uh, reinforce their right to refuse. They always have the right to refuse, and you need to keep that in mind. Um, a lot of times when they're laying in your chair, they're like laying down, they don't understand everything that's going on. You're using a lot of, you know, really fancy language and they feel powerless whenever they're dealing with people. I mean, imagine how you feel when you go and you talk to a, the doctor, you know, you probably feel like, oh my gosh, this person knows everything. If I ask questions, they're going to think I'm stupid or, you know, like I have no control. <laughs> like my insurance, they'll, we'll, we'll do whatever my insurance covers kind of thing. Um, so it's important to try to transfer that power back into their hands and let them know that they have control of it. Uh, when it comes to informed refusal, so this one's a tricky one because a lot we ask this patient, we well, we at, we talk about this a lot in every type of class, right? Informed refusal. So in our informed consent, we have to let them know, hey, you have the option to not do this thing, right? In x-rays, remember, they have the option to not get x-rays. They have the option. But essentially, we also have the option to say that's not the standard of care. I can't, if I can't practice the standard of care, I can't knowingly, knowingly neglect you, so I can't give you treatment, right? In the same sense as this, so they have informed refusal. They can refuse all or any part of the proposed treatment. So if they say, you know, you're like, well, I recommend doing non-surgical periodontal therapy with oral irrigation, you know, with laser therapy and Arrestin on 25 sites. You're, they're like, whoa, I just want the non-surgical periodontal therapy. And you're like, oh, okay, that's everything else got refused. They signed a paper saying that they did and everybody moves on. Informed consent documents. So always, always, always have the patient sign. There are, yes, they do, you know, verbally agree to things and sometimes they, uh, you know, uh, implied agree to things. But the best way to do this is just to get them to sign a piece of paper that says whatever it is that will help you out a lot in your uh, arguments of the case and then use simple straightforward language with common terms so when it comes to informed consent paper you want to use okay this is the term non-surgical periodontal therapy but then you also might put deep cleaning somewhere in that form or when you're explaining it to your patient so that they understand whatever it is right because they might not know what non-surgical periodontal therapy is and then use a translator whenever necessary. So uh, your book also says don't have a child translate for things. Um, ultimately, a translator should be someone of age because then that person is also kind of responsible for certain things if there is a miscommunication. Um, provide ample time to answer patients' questions. So, you know, don't ever be in a rush. I know that sometimes, especially in offices, you're kind of in a hurry. We need to get them to agree to this treatment so we can get started on it, so I can get them out the door because I have another patient in 10 minutes, right? Yes, but if they have questions, you need to stop. You need to allow that to happen because while it might save you $30 so that you can get on time with your next patient, it's going to cost you a lot of money in the long run. Your legal responsibility, um, so as hygienists, you are legally responsible for the treatment that you provide. Uh, failure to obtain consent from the patient for services can have serious legal consequences. Without informed consent, <clears throat> patients can claim battery, right? Remember assault and battery, right? So they can claim battery for providing treatment that was not agreed upon. Essentially, you touched them without them consenting to that if they didn't sign an informed consent. And then negligence. So patients can also claim negligence for the failure to provide sufficient information for the patient to make an informed decision. This type of negligence is also called malpractice. This is at the bottom of page 215. Um, I would probably star those three little guys there. So what is required to demonstrate informed consent? Here, for informed consent to be complete, you want to have a periodontal diagnosis in language that the patient can understand. You want a thorough discussion of proposed periodontal treatment and benefits in language the patient can understand. You want to discuss the risks and the likelihood of success. 
it's really important that if you have a patient who has severe periodontal disease, that you're not giving them false hope. That is, uh, that's, that's just wrong. Don't do that. Discussion of alternative treatments. So, you know, do they have the option of periodontal therapy alone, or do they have the option of, you know, SCRP plus lasers plus Arrestin plus all of those other things. Give them all of the options. And then document that the patient was encouraged to ask questions. Sometimes they don't ask questions, but as long as you put, you know, patient didn't have any questions or, you know, asked patient for questions, patient had none. That's going to suffice this. What is the documentation? for informed consent. So again, the documentation that they are of legal signing age and mentally competent, right? You can't have 17 year olds sign their own form. Uh, although your book does talk about that each state has a different legal age. So depending on where you are, um, there could be a different legal age for them to sign the form. Just make sure, you know, if you're uh, in one of those states where the consent form or the consent age is younger that you're getting consent from people who can give it. Uh, you have to get their signature on the form. Um, and then you, you want to have a witness to their signature to assure that it was uncoerced. So uh, a lot of times this is like not always done simultaneously, but um, ideally, yes, it's simultaneous. So you have the dentist explaining things and the patient signs it and you maybe as the hygienist sign as a witness. So the format for those consent forms can be both written or verbal. Uh, ideally, you want written. So in the written one, it needs to document refusals as well as consents. Um, and then once it's signed, it's going to get entered into that patient's permanent record and it stays there forever. And then verbal. So if the patient verbally says um, that you know they agree to whatever or they're cool with that, then you're still going to write that in your note. OK, there is no way around not having to write it. I understand like implied they came in, they sat down, you told them we're doing surgical therapy today and they're like, sure. Uh, or they didn't even say anything. They just kind of opened their mouth. Right. That one's considered implied. That one doesn't hold up in court very good. So make sure it's either written that they signed it or it's verbal and you wrote it down.